Hi guys. Break a leg. If we could get everybody to take their seats, we're going to get started. It's 9.05 a.m. <laughs> Hello, HLAA. Welcome, welcome. I'd like to thank all of you for being here this morning. We have a very exciting panel plan for you today on employment issues for people with hearing loss. And the way we envision this is each one of our panelists is going to take just a few minutes, about 10 or 12 minutes, to talk to you about things they wanted to share with you. And then once we've gone through all of the panel solo presentations, we're going to take a 10 or 15 minute break and then come back and we're going to have questions and answers. The plan is to have microphones set up, I believe I can see them, so that you can voice your question. If we run out of time, and I expect that we might because we're going to have so many very good questions and things to talk about, you will have an opportunity to tweet your questions or you may email them because every single one of you that are here this morning are very important to us. You all came here to learn something and we want to make certain that you get what you came here for. So um, if we don't have an opportunity for you to voice your question um, to the crowd, please know that we will answer your questions. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to tell you just who I am. I'm Valerie Stafford Malice. I'm honored to serve you as co-chair, vice chair of the HLA Board of Trustees and also, I work for a living. I'm business development manager for Alternative Communication Services, an international captioning company. The other members on our panel are Brian Patrick Jensen, director of emerging markets for communication services for the deaf. Brian, can I get you to raise your hand, please? <laughs> Woo! Brian has uh, presented at HLAA before. We also have Lori Golden, Ability Strategies Leader with Ernst & Young. We have Becky Montgomery, Senior Content Developer for the Office Suite of Programs and Accessibility Lead at Microsoft. We're pleased to have Bob Vettery, Senior Workplace Accommodation Specialist at, and Global Corporate Responsibility at Northrop Grumman. And Bob is accompanied by Samantha Yang, IT Manager at Northrop Grumman. We have Lisa Hamlin, Director of Public Policy, Hearing Loss Association of America. And last but not least, we have Barbara Johnson, IT Project Manager at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT. So, just want to start off by giving us all a common footing. Um, what you're looking at is a screenshot of a page on the HLA website that is under the section Basic Facts About Hearing Loss. And I want you, when you get home on your own, to take a look at this, because there are some very interesting things that you may not know. Uh, it is estimated by many reputable sources, such as the CDC, the Johns Hopkins Medicine, National Institute on Deafness and Other Communication Disorders, and the National Institutes of Health, that approximately 20% of Americans report living with hearing loss. That is an astounding number. That is 48 million people. So um, you are all part of a very large fraternity of individuals living with hearing loss. Also, contrary to popular belief, most individuals with hearing loss are not at the ends of their lifespan. It is estimated that approximately 65% of individuals with hearing loss are either in the workplace, working, or in those age groups or in school. So the demographics of hearing loss are changing. Why is this important? Why are we even here today? 
Well, you know, for so many years, people thought about hearing loss as just being a social inconvenience. But actually, more and more data are showing that hearing loss is costing our nation billions and billions of dollars in terms of lost productivity. And that doesn't even take into account the human cost of untreated hearing loss. Obviously, hearing loss impacts an, an individual's ability to communicate in the workplace, but it also impacts their ability to pick up new skills in the workplace, to follow direction, to fit in with their peers. It might affect their balance and safety. It affects their ability to tolerate an eight or 10 or 12 or 14 hour workday. It's huge. And I'm not showing you these pictures to paint a dire picture because the good news is something can be done about it. And indeed, some workplaces are doing things about it. And that's what you're gonna hear about today. While there exists a strong correlation between aging and hearing loss, again, 65% of people with hearing loss are younger than 65 and they are active in school and the workforce. And these statistics come from a variety of very esteemed researchers, one of which you're honored to have on your board right now as chair, Dr. Meg Walhagen. So you will have access to all these PowerPoints and you can check these references out for yourself. Hearing loss impacts an ability, an individual's ability to earn a living. People with untreated hearing loss lose between $220,000 and $440,000 in earnings over their lifetime. Is there anybody in this room that's been forced out of the workplace because of their hearing loss? Yes, I see hands. So you know, these numbers come as no surprise to you. Also, hearing loss impacts a family's income. A 2004 survey and a 2010 survey showed that incomes of households headed up by wage earners with hearing loss suffer a tremendous economic impact. And we're gonna hear ways today in this symposium that that can be mitigated. So very, very exciting. And why does it matter? Well, if you, even if you don't care about the dollars and cents, untreated hearing loss and an individual's inability to work to their capacity can have tremendous effects on their self-esteem, it can have effects on their family relationships, their work and school performance, and their social life. So this is a physical, a mental, a spiritual, an emotional, and an economic issue. And we are gonna talk about answers today. So, without further ado, I am going to step back and let our first presenter, Lori Golden from Ernst & Young, take over. And somebody's gonna come help queue up the PowerPoint slides, I believe. <laughs> ah, thank you. All right, so, if you can find it, it's the one with the black background. Thank you. And to change it yeah. to arrow down or arrow over. Okay. Good morning. It is <laughs> it is really a privilege to be here. Uh, what I'd like to share with you today is uh, a little little bit about one firm's uh, approach to uh, what we call not disabilities but diverse abilities and specifically some of the ways in which we're working to create an environment um, where people who are deaf or have hearing loss can feel comfortable and, and feel fully productive. Uh, just in, in case you're not familiar with Ernst & Young, uh, Ernst & Young is a global accounting, uh, financial services, and advisory firm with about 200,000 people around the world. We're often asked um, when we're talking uh, about disabilities, how many people with disabilities we have. And the answer I always give is, we feel we have nobody with disabilities at the firm. 
we have 200,000 people with diverse abilities, and we value the diversity of those abilities. There's <laughs> Thank you. There's a good reason why. Um, I don't know how many uh, large uh, organiz global organizations can say this, but we owe our founding to disabilities. Our founder, Arthur Young, was deaf. He also had low vision. And he was trained, and this was in the 1880s, around the time of uh, this, this station was built, as a lawyer in Scotland. And in that era, he really couldn't effectively practice law in the courtroom uh, because of his disabilities. So um, being an innovator, um, he came to the U.S. and became an entrepreneur. Uh, he, the field of accounting was newly emerging, and he entered the field, um, developed new accounting practices, and founded his own firm. So for over 120 years, um, we've been an organization that has been built upon the innovation, the creativity, the spirit of entrepreneurship that comes with people who are dealing with challenges, and specifically, somebody who is deaf. So what you see pictured here um, is, it looks like an ad, but it's not actually an ad, it's a billboard that um, we put up in Times Square adjacent to our America's global headquarters uh, to signal to the marketplace and to signal to our people just how important the idea of diverse abilities is to us. Um, our corporate purpose is building a better working world. And what you see pictured here um, are three of our people in the office who are members of our Accessibilities Resource Network, which works on diverse abilities issues, talking about that commitment. To understand kind of our approach, you have to understand a little bit about how we see abilities. At EY, uh, we feel that cognitive, mental health, and physical abilities are part of a spectrum, and that it's not a question of whether you have disabilities or typical abilities, it's really a question of where you are on that spectrum at any time, because we all have varying abilities, and throughout the life cycle, we all move up and down on that continuum. We feel that people are disabled not by a physical reality, but by the environment and by others' perceptions. And that it's our challenge and our responsibility for us to fully leverage all our talent as an organization and for us to fully leverage all our talent as a society to change the environment and change those perceptions. We know, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> we know that Diverse abilities, just like other kinds of difference, um, bring value to an organization. Uh, I spoke about the Arthur Young example, bringing entrepreneurship and innovation. We also know, and plenty of studies on diversity show this, that diversity results in superior business results, better business solutions, and diversity in abilities is just one of those differences. Our mission is to enable talented people of all abilities to be comfortable and to do their best work. So we'll talk a little bit about um, how we do it. We really focus on, on three key areas, building an inclusive culture, building an accessible environment, and problem solving, which is often called accommodations, but what problem accommodations really are is how one adapts the environment for people rather than adapting people for the environment. So let's talk a little bit about culture. We make efforts to signal to our people 
uh, and to the marketplace that we're a culture that includes people of all kinds of physical abilities. So uh, we include images of people with apparent disabilities in our materials and on our sites. We have mentions in our leader messaging when we're talking about forms of difference and forms of inclusiveness. Um, abilities are, are usually mentioned. We make efforts to tell stories and to put people who have apparent disabilities or people who are open about non-visible disabilities up as role models to tell their story. Our own uh, America's chairman, Steve Howe, got up at an event on diverse abilities that, that we held uh, a year, a little over a year ago, for 250 of our biggest clients and began by telling of the story of his own father who had disabilities. That sets a tone for our clients, sets a tone for our people, letting them know that this is part of not just how we were founded, but who we are today. We make efforts to educate people very broadly um, and then to include diverse abilities, connection points into other efforts. Uh, last spring, for instance, we did a firm-wide fitness challenge, um, and that fitness challenge benefited the National Ability Center, uh, a National uh, Adaptive Sports and Recreation Center in Salt Lake City. We donated um, uh, adaptive bicycles, we fielded a team for an adaptive, and then uh, an adaptive bike race, and then we produced a video making the connections between um, high performance teaming and leveraging all abilities and how we were doing that. And we showed that internally. So we try to weave what we're doing in our messaging into all kinds um, of efforts around the firm, even if it doesn't seem to relate. Obviously, having an accessible environment is key. And so we focus on making sure that our offices are comfortable and can be productive for everybody. Uh, one of the things we do, uh, we've developed a process we call wheel throughs, where we have a team of people that actually goes, uh, and one individual or more is in a wheelchair through every inch of our offices from the outside and the parking deck through all the different spaces we have um, to note areas for improvement um, in accessibility for all abilities. And, and then we work on that. We make an effort um, and have a, a global strategy uh, to make our technology progressively more accessible. Last year, we introduced a policy in the Americas of captioning, and if we can't caption, providing transcripts um, of all our audio programs on a routine basis. Uh, I'll admit that doesn't always happen. It's something that we're working. It is an official policy, and it's something we're working on. So it takes continual champions, um, continuous championing um, to make sure that it happens every time because we have all kinds of programs coming out. And it takes a while to, to get the word around. Um, and then we have a very strong commitment to problem solving, um, also known as accommodations, but it's not accommodations in the traditional sense of a piece of equipment only. Um, it's really a question of taking a step back, understanding that each situation is unique, and taking a team approach to coming up with a way of solving not just what is asked for, but what the real underlying issues might be, and delving into what those might be. And I'll, I'll go through a few examples. Thank you. Five minute warning. <laughs> um, we have a workplace services um, individual working with us who has low hearing, and he came to us requesting an amplifier or clarifier uh, for his telephone headset, pretty basic request. And we very quickly were, were able to do that, but 
we talked with him about what other challenges he might have in the course of his day-to-day -day work um, and really probed. And it turned out that one function that he was having trouble with is team meetings. His team had uh, meetings once a week, live, face-to-face. -face. Everybody on the team uh, was asked to rotate uh, in uh, facilitating those meetings. And he couldn't quite follow. So we worked with him and then worked with his team and his managers um, to develop and then implement. And we didn't announce it was for him. We just made the standard practice in his team a set of protocols that would make it easier for him and for others to participate. Um, we determined that for each meeting, however informal they wanted to, to, to think it was, we really needed a, a written agenda in advance. So he had a written reference point. Um, and we would whiteboard what was going on during the meeting as, as the meeting went forward. So if he missed something, it could be written down. We also made it a practice to, at the start of every meeting, remind people to limit use of acronyms, to at least spell it out um, the first time, but be mindful of not tossing around acronyms because people can sometimes miss them um, and then not be on track with the rest of the conversation. To remind people to face forward and to not cover their mouths when they're speaking and to speak one at a time um, and not speak over one another. Basic rules that all of you know, but a lot of people don't think about day to day. So the idea was to crystallize those into a set of practices, practices that you all know backwards and forwards, but then to make those known to people and to remind people every time that that's how we run a meeting so that the meeting could be more productive and more comfortable for everybody participating. And then the last thing we did, which hadn't been done before, is assign a note taker, just like there was a rotating facilitator. Um, and that note taker would create notes for the meeting and then distribute it after to the group. So if he had missed anything, there was, again, a written reference point. That made a huge difference for this individual. And this individual went from not feeling comfortable facilitating the meetings and missing out on the meetings um, to being one of the most able facilitators um, in his team meetings. And uh, he's, he's become active in our accessibilities resource network as, as a result. He's one of our champions. Uh, these are protocols that we use at EY in lots of ways. We try to teach our project managers, particularly um, when they're working with the, uh, on the phone, and we've developed um, a set of tools uh, of these protocols to share with our people, and we share them broadly. They're available on our website to make it easier for people to adopt and remember to adopt practices that are more inclusive of everybody. Another case was a, a tax manager um, who is deaf, and he had some issues where colleagues really didn't know how to communicate with him, and he didn't have um, a good way of having a conversation at the start with his colleagues and with his clients about what was most effective. Uh, people didn't realize, for example, that he was a really facile lip reader, and if you face forward and are across from him, he could read lips very effectively. People who were right in the room with him would sometimes instant message him because they thought they had no chance of, of being followed. Um, we worked with, with Thomas, who's still with us, um, to create a talk track, um, which laid out a kind of set of ground rules for how best to communicate with somebody who is deaf and hard of hearing, and then to customize it for the individual. Um, so we've created a guide for our people to be able to sit down and educate their colleagues, um, their clients, their contacts, um, 
so that it's easier for everybody. Things like um, when to communicate in person versus writing, um, putting a reminder uh, on stationary, on email stationary, that voicemail is not a good way to communicate, the ground rules for face-to-face -face communication. And I'm happy to say that this was about two years ago, and Thomas is not only moving up in our organization, but he actually does a lot of teaching and training. And he's one of our best trainers and facilitators in his area. So we've had some real success, both for individuals and developing some processes and some protocols that we can teach and share with others. Um, and those are all available on our website, ey.com slash abilities. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. And Lori, will be available after the break. We'll be able to answer questions. Now, if I can get my slide assistant to come up, and we're going to queue up Brian Patrick Jensen's slide program, and he will continue. Thank you. Good morning. OK. We're up. <laughs> Brian Patrick Jensen, and I want to talk to you today about um, getting real about diversity. Uh, I, want to, I want to talk about my personal experience as an HR professional who was suddenly stricken with profound hearing loss. I am, that's my resume on the slide, I am a seasoned HR professional. Seasoned means anything after 20 years of experience. That's the word, that's the buzzword that you use. You're a seasoned HR professional. My resume goes back, um, right now I'm the Director of Emerging Markets uh, Communication Services for the DAP um, in a more of a sales mode than I used to be. Um, but I, my background is all in human resources. I was working for a company called Movers Specialty Service for six years. I was the Vice President of Human Resources there when in 2010 I was stricken with sudden and profound hearing loss. So I had 25 years in HR overseeing employment of thousands of people, and I never, not once, hired, assisted a person who was deaf or hard of hearing. Not once. You know, I don't know where, where they all were. You know, there's, we just talked about the statistics of 20% 20, 20 of the people uh, are affected in the workplace who are, de who are deaf or, or hard of hearing. In 25 years in my um, progressive HR experience, and I did pride myself as a progressive HR person. Uh, we had done a lot of great things. We won a lot of awards. We were doing um, very innovative things. Uh, I took a great deal of pride in the diversity training that I did. Uh, but I didn't know how to accommodate someone who was deaf or hard of hearing, even after 25 years of experience. And the Society for Human Resource Management certification test doesn't say anything about loops or or hearing aids, or it talks about the law, it talks about compliance, but it doesn't talk about the practical things that a person needs, like CART and captioning, uh, to accomplish what um, everyone else can accomplish in the workplace. Those things were not taught. I had not come across anyone who was afflicted the way I was. Uh, I would, to me, it was a completely unique, uh, different experience. I didn't know there were hundreds of people uh, like you out there. I, I had not had the... Um, honor to assist anyone who required uh, any kind of assistance with, with sound or anything like that. So it was a completely new prospect to me, and it was much different. That's not Mitt Romney, by the way, after the election. That's me. <clears throat> um, what happened to me is I was tone deaf since early childhood. Uh, I had sudden central neural hearing loss back in 2006. From there, I wore hearing aids, but I could muddle through. And then in spring 2010, I have had suffered profound bilateral hearing loss. Um, and that meant from one of my ears, about 80 decibel hearing loss, and the other, it was 90 decibel hearing loss. So I could, you know, virtually, it was virtually silent, you know, which was a very, very, very difficult situation. I talked a lot about this yesterday um, in a topic on perseverance. <clears throat> so all the things that I did in my job, and this is basically when you're going to accommodate a person, you have to do a job analysis. So my job analysis is the first is look at the essential functions of the things that I was doing 
And then how can they be accommodated? So I was interviewing, I was training, I did what they call client shows, I made a lot of presentations to our customers, I met with a lot of customers on a regular basis, I did the employee relations counseling, meetings, the media write-ups, I did a lot of writing for, um, for a lot of folks, I did all the benefits comp, broker negotiations, a lot of interaction, that's the nature of being a human resource professional. How was I gonna do all this? How was I gonna do all this now that I can't hear anything? And that only wasn't my question, that was the question of my boss, who was the president uh, of the organization. Uh, great guy, I was basically enjoying the um, a reputation of being second in command there. We were, I, was, I was his right hand person, I loved the organization, I loved the company, but they were as clueless as I was in terms of how to handle this. And the situation changed dramatically after I lost my hearing. I mentioned a couple of these things yesterday. Meetings, I had an open door policy. Folks would come into my office, maybe 20 people a day would pop by. That number went from 20 to zero after I lost my hearing. People did not stop by anymore because either it was awkward and they didn't know what to do about my new suffering hearing loss, but mostly they didn't stop by because it was harder. It was harder to communicate with me. We started using Dragon Dictation apps. Post-it notes became very, very important. My own team was always trying to help me out, especially with, with conference calls, taking notes. We were really scrambling, trying to figure out you know, what to do and, and how to do it. And again, my, my, um, my boss, it was not that he was uh, not supportive. The company was very supportive. They simply did not know what to do. So we began trying different things. I'll tell you a couple of stories of how this panned out. Most folks here are familiar with CapTel. Uh, I used my iPhone um, for captioning anytime that uh, I made a phone call. And so the captions come up on the phone. How many uh, you folks are very familiar with this, I assume? Came up on my iPhone so I could read what a person is saying when they were talking to me. I used CART in personal meetings. One of the rumors that started to float around is that the Human Resource Department was recording all conversations that employees were having. You know, that was, that was, and that rumor was started by executives who were concerned that all their meetings, their confidential meetings were now being recorded and were, were subject to writing. You know, and that became a major, a major issue in this organization simply because they did not understand that this was a combination it, wasn't a, it, was, it had nothing to do with recording them, but it was an accommodation that, that I needed. But I had to look up all the legal ramifications of who owns the cart, for example. When somebody does cart um, for, for, for us, who owns that information? The person who pays for that information owns that information. But they were the kinds of questions that came up. I worked there, I muddled through for about a year and a half, and in the end, it was just too difficult. I, I myself, was not uh, at all knowledgeable about these things. I had to Google all this stuff to learn about it. I did make contacts, including with HLAA, to, uh, for help, to ask them, how do I deal with this situation? And HLAA was extremely helpful. It was, it was an, an awesome experience. I have t I've taken to, uh, organizational effectiveness was part of my job. I have taken to um, looking at the different gadgets that are out there that can help us for deaf and hard of hearing. One of the ones that we've used now at CSD to great effect, and I'm starting to use with my colleagues uh, on the board at ALDA, uh, is a project management tool called HipChat. HipChat is basically a chat tool. Is anyone familiar with HipChat? Okay, HipChat is one of the many chat tools that are out there, but it gives you private rooms where you can do projects and keep all your documents. And so you can chat in real time back and forth with your colleagues, and you can do that from across the hall. So we organized all of our major projects in these rooms in HipChat so I can collaborate with my colleagues in real time using this tool. Um, it's a great tool for that. I highly recommend that tool. There's lots of other kinds of tools like that. But this was the kind of stuff that I was digging into, I was trying to do um, in, in, in my position. I called it Skyping the Halls was another one. You're allowed to use Skype, you're allowed to make a phone call you know, across the hall to a colleague. So I was using Skype on a constant basis with my colleagues and combining it with um, CART. So I could see on the, on the Skype, you know, the captions flowing across the screen. So anytime I needed to meet with a colleague, I actually didn't do it face to face as much as I did it. I got my five minute warning. <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna, on purpose, I'm gonna go four minutes and then I'm gonna go an extra minute for the last person. Um, so, so this was the kind of things that I was doing. I was looking at project management tools, gadgets, 
Uh, I used CapTel, I used CART. Meanwhile, my employer was doing other things. They soundproofed my office uh, for $10,000. It cost them to soundproof my office on the premise that I was talking louder, I guess, than, than I used to. So, so this is the kind of thinking that, that, you're, that employers that don't know how to do this, this is the kind of thinking that they have. They soundproof an office for 10,000 bucks, but then they give me heck for $100 an hour on cart because you know, I'm using it incorrectly or I'm using it to break confidentiality. It's this kind of misunderstanding that you have to plow through you know, with intelligent people. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major challenge, and I lived that challenge because I was one of them. I didn't know. I didn't know. I truly took pride in the idea of being a progressive HR person who I thought was real about diversity. And I was humbled, greatly humbled, by this experience of, of losing all hearing. I now have a colloquial implant. That happened a year ago. That has been amazing. So I feel like I'm bouncing back when it comes to the, when it comes to, uh, the challenges you know, that, that I faced. I've been very, very blessed in my career. I'm super blessed to belong to uh, communication services for the deaf now who has no problem, you know, accommodating me and um, uh, with all my needs. And I'm particularly blessed to be part of an organization like HLAA that gives me the opportunity to share my story, you know, with you good folks and to get the support that I need. It's one of the best things that has ever happened to me was this hearing loss in that I am a better man than I have ever been because of it. And I am a better HR professional than I have ever been because of it. Thank you. I'm sure I'm not the only one sitting here with goosebumps. Hang on, folks. You're in for a lot more. Now I would like to ask um, my PowerPoint person to come up and cue the slides for Becky Montgomery from Microsoft. And we also got the note about not being able to see some of the speakers over the microphone. So we have a, a stand here that we're going to try to use <laughs> when it's necessary. Well, you're really not going to be able to see me because I'm a shrimp. Becky, can you, can you stand on a, a, a big box? Will that mess up your balance? Well, you've got a ladder. Can, can you back up just a second? Yeah. Okay, you're good. There's a chair you can hang on. Let me get this in place for you. <laughs> Is this cool or what? Yay! Okay, so hold down. Oh, okay. That, you're on your front slide now. There? Okay. Yeah. I'm Becky Montgomery, and I work for Microsoft. I, um, I do, for Microsoft, I try to help make products more accessible. I review, I work in Word and Excel and Outlook and products like that. And I, I review designs before they're coded and then sometimes get to review the products after they're done. Um, and I have profound hearing loss in both ears. I have a cochlear implant in one ear and I am partially blind. So, um, I think that I am, let's see, we'll get there. Where are we here? Would you like me to do that for you? Are you happy? Where am I? It didn't work. Oh, okay. Hang Page on. down. Let me see. 
We have a technical problem here. Does anybody know anybody who has anything about computers here? <laughs> well, I'm not very technical. <laughs> But I am passionate about opportunities for people. And I really, really, really care about whether people have an opportunity to do things like learn to read, learn, you know, grow, have an opportunity to make a living, things like that. And I have to confess to you that I'm a girl and I grew up in a family of brothers and I think all of this interest and opportunity started back then. Because when I was a little kid, my brothers got to join the Boy Scouts and they got to do cool stuff like camping and canoeing and stuff like that. And back in those days, you know, that was sort of before we had cars and stuff like that. <laughs> Back then, <laughs> Girl Scouts didn't do much fun things. They did sewing. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and I thought this was colossally unfair. So I decided to join the Boy Scouts. And <laughs> my middle name is Howard. So I signed up for the Boy Scouts as Howard Montgomery and I thought it all worked. I thought it all worked just fine until my father came home one day and said, I got a call from the scoutmaster. Does anybody know Howard Montgomery? <laughs> well, <laughs> okay, so anyway, I took all of that passion for fairness and wish for opportunity, and I went into teaching at the community colleges, and everything was, I loved teaching, it was wonderful. Everything was glorious until suddenly, like Brian, I had sudden and profound hearing loss, and as you see, you saw me do my little weeble thing up here, you know, where Valerie, you know, where, you remember the weevils? <laughs> um, and I, you know, no hearing, no balance, all of this kind of stuff. And it's really hard to get questions from students when you can't hear what they're saying. And so I stopped teaching and, and eventually ended up at Microsoft. There. Now, when I got to Microsoft, my first manager said to me, no excuses. We count on you to contribute to this team. You have to tell people what you need. Now, I'm ready to help any way you can. Now, you know and I know that telling people what you need is not easy. <laughs> I mean, in the first place, you don't know what you need. Um, but what I learned when I came to Microsoft is that Microsoft has very high expectations for employees. And uh, over time, I learned that those high expectations were a very good thing. Um, and you might think that that's kind of an odd thing to say, that it's a really good thing that people expect a lot out of you. But the truth is, as a person with a couple of disabilities, one of the painful lessons I've learned is that people see you as less. You know, they expect less of you, and somehow they see you as kind of vaguely not even adult. I mean, to this day, as much as my family knows and daily sees what I do all the time, my daughter still jumps in and orders for me at a restaurant. And I know all of you have had the same experience. Um, so the high expectations at Microsoft, when my managers have high expectations of me, 
what they're communicating to me in the strongest possible terms is that they have enormous respect for my abilities. That they don't doubt for a minute that I'm going to perform at the same level that they might expect anybody else to perform. So high expectations are a very good thing. And on top of that, I'm really lucky because Microsoft is a very inclusive culture. Um, and I suspect it's because Microsoft has people from all over the world, you know, and we have people of every imaginable personality type. And we have a fair number of people who are a lot more comfortable with computers than they are with people. And in that environment, having a hearing loss is just one more way to be different, you know. And um, so I'm, I feel like I'm very lucky to work in an environment that that's, that's that inclusive. So with all of the high expectations, I started trying to figure out what I could do to meet these high expectations, and I started asking for help. I started asking everybody around, what do you do? I found out about captions, and what I found out about captions is that they work pretty well almost all the time, and they're really a lifesaver, except sometimes you still have to pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> There's that catch. <laughs> you can't just space out. In the, uh, <laughs> you never space out, do you? <laughs> so I have a story to tell you about that. And recent, recently, um, I got kind of a painful comeuppance about paying attention. And it was in my performance review of all places, and I found out that I was missing some really critical information. And it was not a cool thing to miss, you know. So, and so I, we ha I have captions for all my meetings, for all my phone calls. Sometimes I have captions when I do social events, you know. But, um, so if I have captions, and I had great captions, really highly skilled people, um, what went wrong? So how many of you use captions regularly? Ooh, lots of hands out there, okay. Well then, you know when you use captions, that captions are just a second or two behind. And sometimes they're just a little bit off, you know, from the, what exactly got said. And in a meeting, when I saw that happen, assuming I was paying attention, that is, um, I was too embarrassed to stop everything and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, can we go back over and talk about something you said just a few minutes ago? because I didn't want to interrupt the flow of what was happening in the meeting. But it turned out that one of those times that I didn't go back and interrupt the flow, the information that I missed was absolutely critical. And so I guess the bottom line is that we all learn all the time, constantly, that we have to pay attention and we have to advocate for what we need, and that we all can be humbled one more time <laughs> while we learn to ask for help and interrupt and say, you know, I didn't get that. Um, it's hard, you know. So I had to go back to my team and talk to them in a team meeting and swallow my embarrassment and say, I missed that stuff and I'm going to be interrupting you in the future to ask about things. And I, you know, I was kind of amazed at how hard it was to start that conversation with them because I work with these people all the time, you know. We know each other. We like each other. They know I'm hard of hearing. They, you know, 
and it was still hard. It was still really embarrassing. But we all have to do that. We all have to advocate for ourselves, and we all have to stay tuned in to what we're missing and recognize that that, that kind of vulnerability that you feel is only inside you, that everything you needed to tell everybody, they already know. And that, Five minutes, oh my God. I need to talk faster, okay. We have an employee resource group and um, at this point it's very, very active and it's a really wonderful way for us to get together and work together. But now there's several thousand people in the resource group and we're really, really active, but it didn't start out that way. You know, we started about 15 years ago and started with a picnic. And it was just the huddle group, which is the heart of hearing people and their families. And one of grandma, I was the grandma. Mm -hmm. Their token grandma there. Anyway, <laughs> it's really astounding what happens when you grow one step at a time as you get more and more people taking that step. Um, Huddle is a group that we have on campus that's just hard of hearing people. And as it says here on the slide, the, we don't meet and we sure don't use the phone. We email each other and IM each other constantly. And sometimes people inside Huddle have projects. Like my project is that I like to work with new hires to work to reach out to help them. So I said that it's amazing what happens when you get together and take one step at a time. And by this point, the employee resource group is doing things that for me as an individual have gone beyond amazing and have gone into thrilling. Um, for example, we have, we have an ability summit every year. And, we do what we call, I mean, you know, we're a bunch of com computer people, and when we get together to have fun, we do hacking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so when we had an ability, <laughs> when we have an ability summit, we do a hackathon, <laughs> which means we get together and just forget about what time it is outside and we try to solve a problem because that's what we do. And some of the wonderful things that have come out of hackathons that you, you might have seen last year, we had a Super Bowl commercial of a guy who used to be a Super Bowl football player, Steve Gleason, who has ALS. But the, we call it the eye gaze project where somebody can control the direction of a wheelchair or with their eyes and use their eyes to select words on a screen so if somebody who can't talk that project came out of a hackathon and this year when we did eye gaze at the hackathon <laughs> we recruited wheelchair people from all over Seattle so we had people hundreds of people with wheelchairs and computers riding all around the Microsoft campus giving us information about what they could see and what they couldn't see and what was hard to do and what wasn't hard to do and all these engineers running along beside them taking notes. <laughs> but we had a hackathon and we got better at iGaze. And a couple projects every year get funded out of this. So we've come a long way but there's so far to go. And I think that all of us have had the experience of feeling like you had a victory and that you just, oh, I finally got there. I climbed to the top of this little hill and you get up to the top and when you get to the top, all you see is how much there is left to do, you know? And we've made progress You've made progress, I've made progress, ERG has made progress, we've all made progress together, and there's a lot left to do. So, 
among the things that we'd have to do at Microsoft, for example, is that we need to do a better job of making our work environment more accessible to people with disabilities. Our big bugbear right at the moment is our cafeteria, um, which is hard to use for people with disabilities. We want our products to be better. Out of time? Okay. Okay, this is, fortunately, I'm at my last slide. Can I do this one? <laughs> okay. So the question is, what can you all do? Um, the most important thing you can do is to pay attention, unlike me, pay attention, discover what you need to make you more productive, and ask for it and become part of a community, HLA, whatever it is. You're here, so you're already part of a community. And don't forget that the most important thing is to imagine that look out and try to imagine a way that it might be better, a way that whatever it is you need might be addressed, and tell each other about that. Thank you. Thank you. Can I get my PowerPoint person up here, please, for our next speaker? Oh. <laughs> Who's next? Bob, it's Bob Bettery from Northrop Grumman, which is this one right here. Okay, let's move this. Well, good morning, and thanks for having me, having us. Excuse me. Um, I'm Bob Bettery from Northrop Grumman, and I'm in my 38th year with this company. And when I started in 1978, in the building that I worked, we had three profoundly deaf individuals. And this preceded the ADA by 12 or 13 years. And, uh, but everybody in the building knew at least the alphabet. So uh, I said, what a great place to work. And, and I was losing my vision, but no, I didn't tell anybody at that time. I'm very proud to work for a company whose number one goal when it comes to resources is attracting the best possible talent available. Uh, our, our team, the Workplace Accommodations Group, um, it's our job to provide the tools and the, the services so that we retain that valuable talent. We are an aerospace and defense company. Half of our employees are scientists and engineers, and it costs us a fortune when we lose one. So uh, I'm very proud of what we do. And some, I'm going I'm to lay out some of the initiatives real quickly, and then my, my colleague, Samantha, is going to work on the challenges because she's a lot smarter than I am. Uh, ASL interpreters has always been part of our culture, as, have, as has your community. But today, uh, we're a lot more aware. We provide, we bring in ASL interpreters for, for every major meeting, for every event, for webcasts. And even if we don't have uh, deaf and signing employees at the event, you never know when you have a parent or, or, or an aunt or an uncle of someone who's profoundly deaf and maybe attending MIT or, or Virginia Tech, and we'd like them to come work for us. So it's a wonderful message. We've recently been deploying the CART technology, which is wonderful, because we have profoundly deaf and then we have low hearing, which many in my generation are certainly um, experiencing. So the computer-assisted real-time transcription is a wonderful tool. We may have it here on the screens. I just can't see it. Uh, we've discovered video relay. And video relay is, is cutting edge. 
uh, communication for, for deaf and signing individuals, and you haven't lived until you work with security, information security, to convince them that, oh yes, this product with two-way cameras and a third party is fine to bring into, uh, in, into facilities. With, we do very high, highly classified work. Uh, the, at the sector where I was working, uh, it took me nearly a year to get the first video relay uh, phone installed. Uh, before I left for the airport yesterday morning, uh, uh, we arranged for mobile video relay to an employee on the West Coast. We're providing the tablet, and uh, so we've come a long way in that area. We're now providing closed caption videos that are coming out of our corporate office, closed captioning for our training, and our third party provided uh, either, either training or surveys. Um, now we're, we're making our vendors give us products that are uh, also uh, have the closed captioning. Because again, it aids the low hearing as well as, as those, those who are profoundly deaf. A really cool initiative that we started about seven years ago is installing passive radiator systems in our major auditoriums and major conference rooms. And these are wireless, I'm not a technical person either, um, but we, when employees come to an event, we're in an auditorium that seats hundreds of people, it's very easy to miss things. We have four different types of wireless headsets. All they gotta do is request one, um, wear it. It, it, it eliminates the ambient noise, but it also, it projects the speakers, the, the, the subject matter directly to the employee. Um, the coolest project I was involved with was, we, I, there's one area in my building where we have two profoundly deaf employees and they came to me for an engagement project and they said, we would like to teach ASL to the 30 employees that work with these two and they've been working with them for years. And I said, well, if you can get your vice president to approve the training time for a 10 weeks course for 30 employees, I'll get my vice president to pay for the DVDs, the books, and the ASL trainers. And um, that, was a, that was a huge success. Uh, the, the, they, they still sign, they still sign back and forth, and uh, it's just made the workplace a better place to be. So I think I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Samantha Yang, and then I'm gonna come back and tell a quick story. Thanks, Bob. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Samantha Yang, and um, I work with Bob. I have a background in IT. I was an IT manager before I joined Bob's team um, on the accommodations and accessibility side. And um, as Bob alluded to, you know, some of the challenges that we face are first and foremost, we are a defense contracting company, which means we have to abide by not only the federal regulations, but also our information security regulations as well. And we have very, we have many areas. We have unclassified, we have classified, we have secret, and we have top secret. And we can't always implement um, all the technologies to accommodate everybody in those environments in the same way. So as um, Lori alluded to earlier, we have to look at each case on a case-by-case -case basis and probe and, and really find out what the best accommodation or what the best solution is for that individual in those different environments. Um, we also have US citizenship restrictions. We have non-disclosure agreement restrictions. Uh, we have software and IT. Uh, limitations and challenges. So a lot of those things we work with a sub team to address the software and, and hardware challenges. Um, and we're making a lot of progress, but as Becky mentioned, we have a lot, a lot more to do and a, a long way to go. Um, and we also have to look at our, our provider's financial status. Um, are they a risk to the company if we do business with them? So there's, there's a lot of challenges that we face. We have a lot of programs that we've implemented that can overcome these challenges. We're working really hard to address them in the various environments that we have. 
And uh, I think, you know, we're making really good progress. So I'll hand it back over to Bob. And we've got five minutes. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sam. Um, you, you know, we love what we do. Uh, in my previous life, I, I worked in diversity and inclusion, and I did a lot of diversity training, and I also did disability awareness and etiquette training, uh, which, which I thought was really a great initiative. And I would travel around different facilities, and I was asked to go out to Southern California and give the disability etiquette training to 44 managers. And a colleague who worked at that facility asked me if I would incorporate an exercise into the two-hour training class. I said, sure, I'm easy. So when we got to the exercise, got 44 managers, and I said, I'm going to give you four choices. You could be deaf, profoundly deaf. You could be blind. You could be paraplegic or you could have substantial mental health issues. If you could avoid one of them, what would it be? So we racked and stacked the results of the 44 uh, participants, and 43 of the 44 said they would never want to be blind. So I asked, who did not choose that? I, I, first, my self-esteem was crushed. <laughs> I, I didn't realize that was such damaged goods. <laughs> so I asked who, who did not choose who, and a, a friend of mine r raised his hand. And when I was starting the um, disability ERG at Northrop Grumman, he was instrumental in starting the LGBT ERG. And I said, well, why did you not choose blindness like everybody else? And Alan said, he said, because you're my friend and I didn't want your feelings to be hurt. <laughs> so, so after I recovered, I said, okay, if you have to choose one, what would you choose? And, and, and I sort of call this, 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 this story an education in misperceptions, because I certainly learned a lot that day as well. So the 44 participants, 35 chose to be profoundly deaf. Thank you. Um, four chose, I think, to be paraplegic. Four chose mental health issues. And of course, Alan chose to be blind. <laughs> and and, and there, was, there was kind of a murmur around the room. I think they were congratulating themselves that they had gotten it right on both answers. And I said, would you like to know what, I, what my choices would be? And they said, well, sure, you know, and I'm there, up there with a the dog, and they've already hurt my feelings, so. <laughs> so I said, if I had to choose one, and maybe it's based on insider information, I would choose to be blind. Because it's, it's not easy, but I already know that I can do it. And I could be relatively successful. I said, if I were to choose one that I would never want, it would be to pr be profoundly deaf. And I mean no offense, this, is, this was just my perspective. And I said, imagine the isolation in a workplace where you're surrounded with people, but no one can communicate with you because they don't speak your language. And as Brian so eloquently put it, people avoid the profoundly deaf. It's, it's, it's like being on an island, but you're surrounded by people. And I said, I don't think I could survive that because, it, it, and, and I probably could, because again, it's my own, mis my own misperception. But they were sort of dumbfounded by the fact, you know, because I think they thought they had gotten both questions correct, but there is no right or wrong answer. So I think they learned a lot. I certainly learned a lot. Um, and uh, we all have, uh, as, as Laurie said, you know, it's, it's, it's all about different abilities. And uh, we want to employ the brightest and the best um, from, from individuals of all abilities. So thank you very much for your time and your attendance.
Thank you, Bob. Next, we're going to have Lisa Hamlin from HLAA. Oh, this feels really good. It's nice to be tall for a while. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Uh, I feel like um, last night after following Senator Harkin, these people here have done so well. Thank you so much for all you've shared with us this morning. Really, and truly. And we have yet one more. We have Barbara to follow, too. Um, I'm the Director of Public Policy at Hearing Loss Association of America. And I'm really happy to be here because what I have seen, employment has been such a huge issue since I've started work eight years ago. And I think part of the problem is that with our recession, what's happened is that we've seen more and more people with disabilities altogether um, see more and more obstacles, more challenges in the workplace. What, what I'd really and truly like to see is more employers that we've seen represented here who really understand the abilities of people with hearing loss, with anybody with a disability, but what we see is people's misperceptions, people's inabilities, and what I also see, that from the employer side, they don't really know. They don't really know what to do or what the accommodation should be like. And what's also true is the employees themselves, they don't know what to ask for. And that is our job. As people with hearing loss who do know, our job is to get the word out. What should we, what can we do, and how can we make things better? So I'm gonna talk a little bit now. Uh, I'm sure most people here know about the Americans with Disabilities Act, We're 25 years old now. Uh, hearing Loss Association is 10 years on it, but ADA is 25 years old. And we know it's an equal opportunity law. It's not an affirmative action law, but it's equal opportunity to open the door and level the playing field in places of employment for people with hearing loss and any kind of disability. Um, now, there is also the ADAAA, which was, happened in 2009, or 2008. It was enacted and came into effect in 2009. And why I bring this up is that it specifically helps people with hearing loss. Because prior to the ADAAA, there were employers and the courts looked at it and said, ah, you have a hearing aid. You don't have a disability, right? OK, so you and I know that putting on a hearing aid is not going to solve your problems, all of the challenges you face on the job. But employers said you don't qualify as a person with a disability. So a group of disability advocates went back to Congress, and they were a little nervous about opening up the ADA, you know, what's going to happen, is it going to be a big fight? But together, they went to Congress and succeeded in opening up the law because it was not just for people with hearing loss, but people with diabetes or epilepsy. People are saying, oh, you know, you're taking medication. You don't have a, you no longer qualify as a person with a disability. So now you do. Under the law, you can, you, if you use your, what they call mitigating measures, your own personal hearing aid, cochlear implant, medication, whatever you need, those mitigating measures are not to be considered when your thought is protected by the ADA. So this, the ADA employs all along the way, from the first stop when you're trying to get the job, all the way through to any point in your employment. So you remember that, you're protected by this law. And after employment begins, you can, they can ask, I mean, we're talking, they can't ask certain medical questions in the beginning, but as long as they treat everybody equally, then they can ask medical questions afterward if it relates to the job. And it's consistent. Also, it can't be just some medical question out of the blue. It's got to be related to the job at hand. Now, the responsibility of the employer, the employee, must be, they still have to be qualified for the job. You can't just say, well, I'm a person with a disability. I can get any job, right? No, no, no. You have to be qualified for the job you're asking for. And you, should have a basic understanding of the accommodations that you will need. It's your responsibility if you're going to ask for protection under the ADA that you should know what it is you're asking for. Now, the employer 
must provide the accommodation as long as they've been notified. They don't have to guess. The other thing is sometimes employees say, well, shouldn't, you know, why should I have to tell them? Well, we actually don't like the idea of employers saying, you know, what do you need? What, what, I should hire an interpreter for you when in fact what I need is a card. You need to alert the person to the kind of accommodations you need, to the fact that you have a disability, so that the employer is not the one making assumptions about your needs. At that point, if it's an undue burden, if you're asking for some, if you're in a little, first of all, it has to apply to um, uh, employers who have 15 or more employees. But if it's a small shop, and you're asking for a large accommodation, and it really is a burden, then they can claim an undue burden. But if it's a large, large organization, they must provide that, as again, as long as it qualifies, it's not an undue burden. Now, there are some cases I wanted to tell you about. Um, I wanted to let you know, we're getting, as I said, we get calls regularly now from all kinds of people with all kinds of questions. And in one case, we had, um, a woman who had been, uh, not a, she'd been having hearing loss her whole life, which is what kind of astounded me in this particular case, because she'd had her life, but she had worked in one particular situation. She was in a, a public school system in the library. She knew her job. It was a quiet environment. She got along just fine. But there were cutbacks, and her employer said, you know, I can't keep you in the library. I want to put you in the classroom as a substitute teacher. She said, oh my God, I'm gonna go in the classroom. It's gonna be so noisy. I'm not gonna be able to hear anybody. Um, so she said, she requested an accommodation, but her accommodation that she requested is send me back to the library. And they said, no, well, there's cuts. We can't do that. And she didn't offer any other solution to the problem. So her employer came up with his own solution. He said, Okay, well, you have a hearing loss, and after we thought about it for a long time, in the copy room, you can take off your hearing aids and wear what they call earmuffs, ear protection. Okay, and in the classroom, remove your hearing aids or use these earmuffs. And then if there's an emergency, then we'll have somebody come along and get you. If, if she had known what it was that she needed, that she could have requested in the classroom. She could have avoided all this. It's not clear that she would be able to get the accommodation you wanted because it never got that far. We actually, I, when I told her, she never got back to me because she really wanted to go back to the library. But in situations where you can't get exactly what you want, you have to find a way to work with your employer. Um, another example was we had somebody, uh, who called us, who in fact was still in touch with us. He wanted to work to, for ATF. Um, it's a federal agency, and he told them about his hearing loss, and he was permitted to be tested with and without his hearing aids. But when it came to the time where they were trying to tell him he was qualified, they said he was disqualified after he failed the hearing test without his hearing aids. No mention was made at all of the testing with the hearing aids. So he requested a reconsideration of his rejection. Um, according, he had to go to OPM. And in fact, one of the, I'm very, we're very lucky at Hearing Loss Association, we have an attorney who volunteers his time. We do not have staff. We can't take on cases. We don't have an attorney staff. I'm not an attorney. Um, but he helps us out as volunteer, and what we'll do is we'll provide advice and guidance. And so we said, there are OPM regulations, you have to go through the process, but you can challenge what they said. This case is still going on, it's been about two years. He has, unfortunately, has another job somewhere else, but he can't believe that they won't, because again, remember I told you about the ADAA, he, they're not supposed to consider mitigating measures. They're supposed to allow him to test with his hearing aids on. And we have been going back to OPM a number of times, because ATF is one of the few agencies that says, we don't test with hearing aids on, and we want to challenge this, and so we're helping, um, we're helping this gentleman try to get through the process, and it's still going. We'll, we'll let you know if he succeeds. Um, 
And then so several, uh, um, Anna Gilmore Hall, is our executive director, has mentioned several times of this case, which is one that is extraordinary to me, too. Here is a situation where Daniel Cariani, he is a New York City police officer since 1989, finally decided he had had hearing loss on the job, and then he moved into an office, which is right, if people know New York City, right by the elevated subway. He said, okay, it's time, I've got to do something about my hearing loss. The other thing about this situation was the union had negotiated a contract that would pay for hearing aids. So he said, great, let me get my hearing aids. As soon as he got his hearing aids, the guy said, ah, you can't work here anymore. Now, being a police officer is working in a very noisy environment, especially in New York City, and there are many officers who we know, just anecdotally, who have a hearing loss, but who, and some of whom actually get hearing aids. I know an agency that provides hearing aids to people with hearing loss. They said, when I brought this case, they said, oh no, you must be wrong, because we provide hearing aids to police officers all the time. So what's happening is, they're getting a hearing aid, they're wearing it at home and on the job. They take it off. To me, this is nuts. But this is what's happened. So he wore it on the job. He was fired. So he challenged it. And I give this man credit. For five years, he, lost, he was not being paid. He was off the job. And he, he has two small children. And he kept at it. I believe he got a job somewhere else for a while. But he kept at it. And many people with employment issues cannot fight that long. They say, I have to move on. It's expensive. It's hard to do. It's emotionally draining. And so one of the things we offered to him, and he came back to us and said, what we, what we provided, beside our expertise and our volunteer attorney helping along the way, and we did file the amicus brief to support him in court. But he said, you know what? I felt so isolated. Nobody I knew, no one I could turn to, certainly other police officers, didn't know what I was going through, but they could call Hearing Loss Association, and we knew and could provide that support. And so we were thrilled when he did get, he, they went into settlement the day before the trial was to start. And he basically won everything. He got his job back, he got um, back pay, and he got a provision that said that people with hearing loss on the job now can wear their hearing aids now. They have to be tested a case-by-case -case basis, which is what we all we ask it for. Look at each individual. See what the requirements of the job. Can they do the job? Do they need an accommodation? If they can, hearing aids or no hearing aids, they should go forward. That's all we wanted to have. And he won those points. And they're going to review. I mean, they still said, OK, New York City has to take time to review but they're going to do it. He's, he won not just for himself, but for all people with hearing loss. And veterans who like to go back to the job, want to be a police officer with a hearing loss, he won for them too. So we give uh, Dan Canrione huge, huge credit for that. Am I out of time yet? I got one minute, okay. So this is, this is my, actually my concluding remarks is that 25 years after the ADA, employers need to know more. As much as we can tell them, many employers want to support people with hearing loss. Let them know what to do. Um, let's give them that information. We will do it. Everybody here, if they did it too, that'd be huge. And employees need to know. They need to know how to find the information, where to go. Um, we're the best um, advocates for people with hearing loss. Let other people in the employment know. They need that information. And then I have some resources. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you Barbara Johnson from MIT will be our last speaker before the break, and then we will take a short break. You, at the break, I'll put up a slide that shows how you can tweet a question or a comment, and when you come back from your break, you can begin lining up in a queue to ask your questions.
closing employment, it's closing employment, <laughs> HLA. Yeah, probably is. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm nice and high up here. This is awesome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good, uh, good, uh, good. Are we still in the morning? So hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be part of the panel, and thank you for sticking around. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing to be last in the lineup, but here I am. Uh, my name's Barbara Johnson, and I'm a full-time staff member at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, also commonly referred to as MIT. And um, first of all, let me talk about what this picture is here. This is me at 10 years old and fourth grade at the Washington Elementary School in Lowell, Massachusetts. And I typically use this photo when doing presentations about my hearing loss because this is the age at which I was officially diagnosed with my hearing loss. At that time, we would have an annual hearing test in the school nurse's office, and she would bring groups of us, yes, groups, into the office at the same time, and we put on those big rubber headphones and she would ask us to raise our hand when we heard the sound. Well, up until this point, I would cheat and I would look at all the other children and when they raised their hand, I would raise my hand because <laughs> it was school, it was a test, I didn't want to fail. So anyway, at this point I realized that's not why they were doing it, so I stopped raising my hand and that was my official diagnosis with hearing loss. And at that time, the prescription was simply to sit in the front of the room so I'd be closer to the teacher, learn how to lip read, and do the best I can. And I did, I did okay, I had more hearing at that time. Fast forward, a few years ago at work, as in my full-time job at MIT, my hearing loss had progressed to the point where um, I was having difficulty, even in one-on-one -on -one conversations. So I looked into it and found that I was a cochlear implant candidate and I got a cochlear implant on my left side, and then just last summer, I got a hearing aid, my first hearing aid, on my right side to supplement the residual hearing that I have. So needless to say, I've had many years of living with hearing loss and figuring out what I need on the work, on the, in the workplace, and um, I'm gonna share a little bit of that with you now. I'm not gonna go through every bullet point in the interest of time, but I'm hoping people will have questions and I'll be around after the presentation as well. So I start with some of the basics. When, when's the last time you had your hearing checked? It's an important thing to keep track of because as we all know, things change and it's important to know where you're at so that you can figure out what your options are. I often ask people things like, do you have a telecoil program on your cochlear implant or on your hearing aid? And sadly, it's not uncommon for people to say, hmm, I don't know, or maybe, or, I think so. So if any of those answers apply to you, which I'm assuming they don't given that you're here at the conference, but if they do, find out because that opens up options for you for assistive, assistive technology. And I was really awakened to that once I got my cochlear implant because at that point I could utilize some assistive technology on the job in specific situations and it made a big difference. Okay, so this is from the perspective of me being in the workplace um, and figuring out what I need to be successful. And as um, previous uh, presenters have mentioned, one of the first things is explaining to other people what it means to have hearing loss or be deaf or whatever your communication issues are because they don't know. People are, cl are clueless. They, like um, Lisa uh, mentioned, you know, giving someone earmuffs. I mean, it's, the people just don't understand. So being able to describe what it is your communication needs are and to tell people what it means to have hearing loss is really important. An example I can give you is um, I was invited to present to an undergraduate class at MIT who were focusing on assistive technology and I talked to them about my hearing loss and my cochlear implants. I told my boss I had done this presentation and she said, well, why don't you do this presentation to our work group? And my first reaction was, why would they care? And, but it, my boss asked me, so I said, okay. And I gave the presentation at one of our staff meetings, talked about my challenges, talked about the technology, and I was amazed at the response I got. People were interested. They thought the technology was cool. 
They may, some of them came up to me and said, you know what, I have hearing loss too. Or, you know what, I have some of those challenges too. So it really sort of made things easier for me in my workplace, but also opened up, um, you know, a lot of communication with my colleagues about communication access. Workspaces. Some people talked about this. The physical space matters a lot to us. Um, an example I can give you is we moved my work, my office, a couple of years ago. And we moved, I got moved into an open work environment. And I don't know if there's employers out here who are promoting that, but I hate open work environments. <laughs> because the noise is really um, is difficult for me and the visual distractions. So for example, I was moved into an open work um, space and it had low partitions, about three quarters, maybe half, and my computer was facing forward and I couldn't move where the computer was and I was continually distracted visually by people walking by because like many of us with hearing loss, I pay attention visually. I'm very finely attuned to that. So I had to move. I need to figure out what to do. And so prior to moving, I scouted out some other areas and other areas in our um, office space to figure out if there was a spot that would work for me. And I sat in a couple of spots and found some options. So with those options, I went to my boss and I said, you know what, I have to move. This, this space isn't working out. She accommodated me, we moved, everything was better. It's not perfect, but it's better. Well, that was one of the hardest things I ever had to do. I think I heard Brian say something similar about asking for help. And you know what? It's OK. <laughs> and you know what? It is hard. And it's still hard for me. But it's a lesson that I keep practicing, and I'm getting better at it. Also, around noise, one thing that's interesting is that many people think, oh, you're, you're, you're deaf or you're hard of hearing. Noise shouldn't bother you. Well, it bothers me more than somebody with normal hearing, because unlike them, I can't filter things out easily. So the background noise presents more of a problem than it does for somebody with normal hearing. And that's a surprise to a lot of people. OK, this is one of the most important things to me, support groups, HLAA. I went to my first HLAA con convention in Providence, Rhode Island. I think it was four years ago now. I'm not sure exactly. Um, and it was a real shock to me. I was amazed. I came into this environment, and all these people who had similar issues to me, um, the, the, all the events were accessible. Um, it was just a, a real awakening. And after that point, I started sharing with other people the benefit of support resources because I just realized how important it was. There are other things like ALDA. Some, some cochlear implant companies have support groups. So look at them, seek them out. It makes a huge difference and you can learn a lot from them and you can also share your story. In your company, as, a, as someone who's actively working, look and see what your company has in place. Some companies have well-established diversity and inclusion groups. Often those are um, affiliated with disability services. Check it out, find out what they had, go meet people. They're not going to come and find you. Like we've been talking about, you have to advocate for yourself. So find out what's in your company, find out how they do things, and if they don't have information, find out what information they are lacking and, and offer it to them, because you can become a partner. Another thing I like to look at is, are there companies like yours, and what are they doing? Well, I would like to maybe get a job with Lori's company <laughs> or, or, or with Bob's company, but because um, they're great models. But a lot of companies aren't at that point yet. So what I do is I, I often talk about at MIT, we refer to the school down the street, otherwise known as Harvard. So while well, we look at them, what are they doing? What are they doing? What are they doing for their employees? Because that can be a motivator for your company. The ADA. The ADA isn't a carte blanche. Um, your employer is required to accommodate you as long as it doesn't present undue burden to them. But they're not required to give you anything you ask for. Again, it's a negotiation. What I have found, like some of the panelists have mentioned, many employers just don't know. They're clueless about hearing loss. They um, are not familiar with what they need to do. And so it's really our responsibility to find out what we need and to let them know. 
Um, unlike some other accommodations, such as special furniture or special software, communication is an ongoing thing. So it presents challenges that they might not have um, had to deal with before. And it's situational, so each situation might need something different. Who's going to pay? People don't like to talk about money, but money is an issue. Um, at MIT, the way the funding happens for disability accommodations is it's the responsibility of a local department. So what that means is if I want to go for a job in another department, I have a price tag that's coming along with me. And while it shouldn't be an issue, and they can't officially say it is, it is a concern that I have. So I like to propose, and I plan to propose to them, the idea of thinking about funding differently, thinking about it as a central thing so that I don't have to worry about it. And I know some companies do that. I think Microsoft might do that. Um, so that, that's another thing to think about. And I'd like to hear questions if you guys have questions or thoughts. And if you're looking for a job, people often ask, do I disclose or do I not disclose my hearing loss? Well, yeah, disclose, because it's going to come up. I would recommend not disclosing as a proclamation, but in the course of talking to an employer, don't hide it. If someone says to you, I want to do a phone interview, I would say, sure, that would be great. I'd love to talk to you. Can we use Skype? Can we use FaceTime? Can we use something visual? Because I rely on lip reading as well. So there, in effect, I have disclosed it, but it's just in the course of the conversation. I would also be really, um, I would encourage people to point out how resourceful we are. People with disabilities have to think on their feet. They have to figure things out at a moment's notice. You're really adaptive. You're really creative. Those are huge selling points for an employee. Build it up. Talk about it, because you should be proud of those skills that you've learned. Maybe the lessons have been difficult, but the results have been really positive for you. That's it. I think I, I, think I made it. <laughs> Okay, thank you everybody. And please come back and let's talk. Right. Inspiring. Can we have another round of applause for our panelists, please? All right, we're going to give you an opportunity to use the restroom. Please be back in 15 minutes. I'm going to put up a slide with um, information about asking questions and answers. You can tweet a question or a comment. If you have something that you would like to ask privately, my email address is going to be up on the slide, and I will make sure that your question gets circulated to all the panelists so you can get a group answer. So. Please feel free to exit the room, and we'll see you back in 15 minutes, please. If we could all take our seats, please. Including the panelists, Brian Patrick Jensen, we need you. We need Becky Montgomery. Could somebody poke Brian Patrick, please? Is Becky Montgomery in the house? We have people beginning to line up for questions. Here comes Becky, great. Okay, we have our cart riders standing by, so when you voice your question, please speak into the microphone, and the cart rider will caption your question for all to see, and then we will have our esteemed panel answer. I'll start with the individual I see right out here. What is your question, please, or your comment? Yes, you. 
question um, has to do with what I have observed as a glaring omission in the presentations of everyone. Uh, I became deaf uh, seven years ago, uh, so I w relied on capturing at that point, and then I have a cochlear implant now and discovered that it's fine in individual situations that are quiet, but it doesn't work in meetings, uh, work situations, etc. So we actually ended up starting a business both to educate and advocate and to install loops. But I didn't hear any person talking about how portable and individual hearing loops can help people in the workplace that have hearing loss. For instance, you know, I'd like the whole world to be looped, but it's not going to be. If somebody, for instance, were having a meeting uh, you wouldn't necessarily need to have a captioner. You could have a portable loop with microphones going out, which would allow people to use their T-coil setting. Everywhere I go, I have my own individual loop. So if I came to this meeting, for instance, and it, if it weren't cap, you know, if it weren't loop, I could actually hand somebody a microphone that would connect directly to my T-coil setting. So. I have a lot of ways that I can participate in my own life, including work situations, that I did not see anyone here addressing as a workplace accommodation for people working in your businesses. So. Thank you very much. As you know, Hearing Loss Association is a very strong advocate for looping and actually has staff people that are dedicated to looping. So I'm going to ask Lisa Hamlin if she would like to say anything about looping. And I think we all have microphones at our seats, so you don't have to Just come up unless you want to. Just to clarify that I'm specifically talking about portable counter and individual loops. We all know about, you know, installed loops, so. Okay, so, um, Lisa, okay. do you want to say something about that or? Okay, Let, here, here's the situation. We absolutely agree that looping can be, a, a hearing induction loop can be really a solution for people who can use that. And that has to be in your toolkit. That's the accommodation you request if that's what you need. But somebody, not, we have to always remember that what works for me might not work for somebody else. What works for me is an induction loop that's fabulous. Let me, let me talk to my employer about either getting a portable loop as you were talking about or even asking them to install the loop in a meeting room. That works, that's great. But other people cannot benefit from that. And those people who cannot benefit from the loop may benefit from CART. The other, I think the other reason we often mention CART is that we find that sometimes our employers are also benefiting from the CART and that they can keep a transcript later. They can, the whole meeting can benefit from the CART. So it becomes in some ways more sellable, but it may not be, a, if you install a loop, that is, have to worry about it again, you don't have to hire the services. So it depends on your employer, it depends on your hearing loss, depends on what you can, can advocate for yourself and what you cannot. I would certainly put it in the toolbox, but I wouldn't say it's the only way. And of course there are other people who need sign language interpreters as well who would not benefit from the loop at all. So it's really an individual thing. If it were one size fit all, boy, our job would be a lot easier. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you for your question. Over here on the next side, Russell, would you like to ask your question or make your comment? Yes, thank you. First of all, let, let me say, thank the panel. There's some fascinating discussions, some fascinating stories, and I think there's some lessons that we, we all take you know, from them. Two questions, if I might. Um, all of the discussions, you know, every, everyone on the panel basically has a job, and you're really talking about accommodations in the job. There wasn't much discussion, you know, about the job search uh, process. There was a comment, you know, about should you disclose, you know, a hearing loss, you know, in the process of the job search. And I think the comment was yes, disclose it. 
Um, I, I think with that it's worthwhile going in a little bit more depth on that. You know, I've been in situations where I've been evaluating job applicants. Sometimes you get 70, 100 uh, CVs to look at. In the first, you're not going to interview them all. You're basically looking, you know, very, very quickly at ways to eliminate all but three or five that you might interview. I would suggest that it may not be a good idea at that stage to disclose a hearing loss. Uh, maybe at the interview stage it might be uh, more appropriate. One for a second question, if I might. Um, there was a lot of discussion, you know, I think around the, the question of whose burden it is, you know, to seek an accommodation. Clearly, the Americans for Disabilities Act puts the burden on the person with hearing loss to give some indication, you know, of what kind of accommodation he or she requires. Um, because, you know, an, an employer, you know, may, may be well disposed but will not necessarily have much idea of, you know, what would, what would work. Uh, at the same time, I'm hearing, you know, I heard particularly from Ernst and Young but also from some of the others, that an effort was being made to go well beyond that, you know, to help the uh, individual involved to ident and, you know, the, the, the people who need to make the accommodation, you know, to identify, you know, what kind of an accommodation is necessary, recognizing that people sometimes don't know. And I, I think that was, that, was, that, was, that was pretty interesting. But, you know, I just wondered whether that's, uh, um, that's more widely, uh, you know, s something that other employers um, um, are doing, doing as well. Thank you. Uh, I don't mean to suggest that what we do is representative. I, I wish it were. Um, Many employers still regard, and you use, you use the term uh, burden of accommodation, accommodation as, as a burden and a compliance exercise and um, something that a need, an individual needs to know specifically what they want and the obligation, as in legal obligation of, of the company, is to say yay or nay. We view it differently, and we hope that more employers will begin to view that our main goal is to have our employees be as efficient and productive as they can be, so they can do their best work. So an accommodation request and or a request for a solution to a problem is an opportunity to help to help an employee do better um, and to help us and uh, allow us to help an employee do better. So it behooves us not to look at it as a yay or nay, check the box kind of function, but as an issue that we need to look at um, as, as a team. We put people together, we, we get different points of view and uh, you know, put a team together to come up with a solution. Um, and, you know, it's really a problem-solving exercise. Um, we feel that that's the only way we can be optimally productive as an organization. When we spend so much time and money to find the best talent and then to train that best talent, if if our people aren't being optimally productive, we're under-leveraging our investment. That's a bad business decision. It makes a, a lot of sense to spend a little bit more time, a little bit more effort uh, to enable everybody who we bring in the organization to do his or her best work. And I think over time, more and more employers are coming to realize now, Bob mentioned the, you know, the cost of turnover. It's too expensive not to have people be successful in your organization, and it just makes sense to take a deeper approach. Uh, I, I would also add to that, to that piece of the question, that different employers are going to respond differently. So in some situations I've heard of, someone will say, 
I have a need for an accommodation, and this is the accommodation I suggest, and that's they say, oh, that's very well, we're going to take it to HR, they're going to investigate the options, and we will come up with a solution. Because in the end, what happens is the accommodation, the, the law is written in such a way that the employer is the one who is paying for the accommodation and who ultimately chooses. Now, the employee still has to be provided an effective solution, effective communication. So if, for example, I request CART and get a sign language interpreter, I can argue they're not providing me the appropriate accommodation. <laughs> but, but it depends. You can still go to the employer and say, that's why it, it really pays to do your homework and say, this is what the options are that will work for me. What, how can we do this as a team? Depending on the employer, you can work them through that process. To go to your first question, though, uh, the issue of when do you disclose is a huge issue for people with hearing loss because it's not like they're, they're coming into the, the interview room in a wheelchair. It's not an obvious disability. So I have friends who say they never disclose their hearing loss until they need an accommodation after they've been hired. But the, here's the problem that's happened now is that years ago, they would go through the resumes, and by the way, I agree, I would never ever put it on my resume. Uh, you might allude to it by saying, well, I belong to HLA, and they, but I would never say I have a hearing loss on a resume. But still, now you go through your list, your HR goes through your resumes, and often now it's a phone interview. Now, I'm going to need them to know that I have a hearing loss if I'm going through a phone interview because I don't want them to think, you know, gee, she didn't really respond to that question, or gee, she went off on a t totally different tact. I know I have misheard on the phone. And even as much as I love my caption telephone, there are times when it hasn't quite come through for me. So I would want them to know up front. And that's why I think, I think it was uh, Barbara mentioned that telling them up front. The other thing that telling them up front does is that immediately the ADA kicks in. If you do not reveal your disability, you have no protection under the ADA. You can't later say, well, gee, they should have known. It's really hard to prove that later if you haven't affirmatively said, I, you don't have to use the word, I need an accommodation, but I need a solution to this problem uh, before we go forward in the interview problem process. Can I jump in? Bob Vettery wanted to say something, too. Yeah, um, uh, great questions, really. Um, I, I just want you to know that, that uh, we actually target my community. Uh, we, we, we send teams of recruiters to careers in the disabled uh, in D.C. because we have such a heavy presence there um, in, in, the, in the backyard of Gallaudet University. Um, we, part of the sponsorship, it, 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 we, we, we extend a, a scholarship to a Gallaudet student every year. Um, Rochester Institute of Technology, uh, which is a STEM university, is one of our target schools. They have a huge deaf population. Uh, we, we support career opportunities for students with disabilities. The mm -hmm. Workforce re Recruitment Plan, we look for talent from these, from these um, pools of resources because um, half of our engineers and scientists in many disciplines that we have, which is our bread and butter, are already retirement eligible. Um, we, uh, addressing the accommodations, uh, not everyone is fully informed. I, I've, had, I've had more than one occasion where I've had a recruiter run into my office in a panic and say, I'm going to I'm going to interview a, a, a deaf student from 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 Rochester Institute. What do I do? What do I do on a telephone interview? I said, Well, I would just I would just relax and speak to them because they're probably either using video relay or uh, some kind of a TTY captel something like that. I said, Talk to them as though you would anyone else. When you bring somebody in, just let me know. We'll bring we'll bring in a signing interpreter if they're a signing individual. We've also harmonized our reasonable accommodation process. So we've taken that decision, uh, we've taken the opportunity to make a bad decision out of the hands 
of hiring managers and, and functional managers because they're not experts in this field. And, and I, I don't claim to be either. I learn every day. I, I told Valerie, I, I expect to learn more at this, you know, at this symposium than I could ever impart from, from the years that I've been doing this. Um, we don't look at uh, an accommodation as a burden in any way because it's, an, in, it's a productivity enhancing device. Um, almost every smart employer I know, uh, they don't give the kind of uh, office chairs that they gave out when I came to work here. They're, they're, they have lo lower lumbar chairs. You have ergonomic keyboards. Just as a matter of course, it's called preventive. Um, and it's a smart business decision, just like any other accommodation. Um, I'm going to go back and research loops uh, because that's something, you know, if I could add that to my inventory and it's useful for someone who's low of hearing, yeah, thank you. you know, then uh, that's what we're going to do. So thank you. Great questions. Can I add something? Yes. Um, I wanted to add one more thing. I know that what Microsoft does is, is a different kind of business, but there are lots of businesses that do this aspect of what Microsoft does. In many ways, uh, disability has been folded into our business now because like Northrop and like MIT and like Ernst & Young, we serve a huge and diverse population. And it's critical that our workforce reflect the people that we're selling to. Um, otherwise, we're going to go out of business. Exactly. You know, it's um, creating things that work for everybody is what we do, all of us. You know, and it's only smart to think that in order to create things that work for all of us, we have to have all of us in the creation process. So you can look at your, your own particular disability and say, what kinds of insights does my disability give me that I might not otherwise have? You know, like Barbara pointed out that she's very visually aware. So she could bring that in, you know. Um, to her, I developed a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> you can do that too. <laughs> I love it. Next question. So I'm. Um, many years ago, I started out in aerospace and I worked for Lytton Guidance and Control Systems Division. They no longer exist. They were bought up. But today I'm employed as a scientist and I work for a global multi-billion dollar company. Um, this has been a very long process for me. I have asked for just a loop system in our convention center. It took me a year of advocating fairly strongly to finally get that. At this point, the loop system is not effective. It doesn't help me what it, as much as it needs to. I've tried captioning. I also have a vision disability that makes reading very difficult. So I can't read fast enough to keep up with the captioning. That's one problem. The second problem is if I'm talking about parts and, and the technical part of what we do, the captioning literally is talking about Disneyland and Donald Duck <laughs> and is not working. So I learned sign language and over a year ago I asked for a uh, access to the relay system and just sign language interpreting. We are still not there. Um, I still don't have access to sign language interpreting at work. I have signed into teleconferences through my own equipment using sign language, and I'm having the same trouble in that the sign language 
interpreter, thankfully, is at least hearing and understanding what's going on, but the signs, they're just not there. They don't have signs for the words that we're using, mm -hmm. and so it's still not as helpful as I need it to be. Mm -hmm. I don't have tools. I need better tools, and I'm out of ideas. Do you have any advice? My company is about a year behind me in terms of what I asked. It takes them a year to catch up. And so it will be about a year before they go, oh, wow, she really can't do her job. I have to have a solution before then. Any ideas from our panelists? Um, I, I'll, I'll take a stab, this is Lisa. Um, the first thing that came to my mind when you spoke about the loop not working was whether the loop was properly installed. So if you can benefit from loops in other situations like this room, which is a fairly large room, and you're doing okay with that, but you're not doing well with the loop that was installed for your company, I would look to go back and say, uh, challenge how it was installed. Um, the fact that you've had to go through a whole long process. I used to, to work out in the field too with hearing people and it took me literally six months to get an FM system that they could not only use for me but for their clients. So it, it is sometimes frustrating. Um, and it's a process that you, it sounds to me like you've gone through pretty much everything in the book. I would continue, but that would be my first suggestion is check to see if the loop works for you and have it reinstalled if it's, or have it checked or have it, whatever needs to be done to make it work for you. Because if you find something works for you in some situations and others are not, then that's a, uh, something to attack. The other thing I would suggest is uh, the cart can be more effective if you provide the cart provider with a dictionary ahead of time. So if they're not familiar with the terms you're using, um, I don't blame the cart provider for putting Disneyland up if, that's the, if she's never heard of a technical term that I probably have never heard of either. You need to give as much preparation as possible that doesn't mean there may be a few missing words, but you might find it more doable if you can provide that prep work. As much of the language that you know is available, the agenda, the names, everything that you can give in advance, and then keep hiring the same person who can then build her dictionary or his dictionary in a way that's beneficial to you and the people in your company. That would be my second suggestion. I'm sure Valerie has more to add to that. Uh, I work in the caption industry, and um, one thing that individuals with visual difficulties sometimes find helpful is modifying the device upon which the cart captions are displayed. Um, there are certain font sizes and styles that are more accessible to individuals with visual disabilities than others. Um, so that might be something that might make the cart more accessible to you. The other thing is, if because of your visual dis difficulties, you can't keep up with the 225 words a minute that the highly skilled cart writer gives you, Sometimes a um, condensation or a meaning for meaning translation of what gets said can be arranged so that you're not trying to read 225 words per minute. Instead, you're reading the essential meaning and the essential words of what gets said, and you don't get buried in so many words. So those are all modifications to the captioning that can be done for you on a trial and error basis to see if that might help. But thank you very much for your question. I'd like Love it. to um, go to the individual on the other side of the room, please. Your question, sir. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Dean Lee, and uh, I'm hard of hearing. And um, I do have a cochlear implant. I uh, just got it installed in 2006. Um, I'm working for Delta Airlines, which is one of the major um, corporations in Atlanta, Georgia. 
My thing is, you know, um, after I set my foot in the door about four years ago as a frontline employee and hoping to work your way up, corporate ladder wise, and I did, got promoted last year, and that was, you know, um, I was, that position was forced by adding me to the hiring manager's team, who is your, of course, manager at that time. That caused a lot of awkwardness, which you don't want. And my issue is uh, the office politics. <clears throat> and I'm sure you understand that. It still exists in every major corporation. For example, um, in office politics, what I meant is, oh, this person has a hearing loss. Hmm, let's find a little things to set that person with a disability or hearing loss up for failure. And they are good at it, They're, they succeed at it. We all know this because uh, say you're doing great in your work, you're a hard worker, you, you do great job at it, great performance, and all of a sudden they come to you one-on-one -on -one and say, well, you did something wrong here and there. There's a little things rather than looking at the big picture. And my biggest pet peeve is they uh, have been with the company for more than 20 years. And honestly, they're not educated in regards to ADA. And also, you have to deal with the HR. It's kind of like a HR is the middle person. And the thing is, once you have a meeting with the HR and the hiring manager, you say, hey, okay, what did you do wrong? What can we do better? And you're really trying to defend yourself. Well, I'm sorry, I have a hearing loss. I want this just a just accommodation. And all of a sudden, they keep towing around the issue and find your work-related problems. And they are good at it by making you, you feel like a failure. And all of a sudden, you give up, you feel isolated, you just don't know what to do. And I've spoke with my colleagues, they said, well, Dean, that's the way it is. You have to have politics. You have to play games with them. And to me, I'm sick of it. And uh, I just need your advice how to overcome it, how to eliminate that. But it is impossible because they can talk anything behind the doors internally and try to find things, how to tiptoe around the uh, person with the disabilities, around um, ADA-related issues. It's, I mean, they're good at it. It's, it's office politics is my issue, so. Well, you came to the right place to ask this question because we have workers and employers, so who would like to go first? I, I can give a shot. I love office politics. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, when I came to communication services for the deaf, about 30% of the employees at the Austin headquarters where I work, they are ASL users, they're profoundly deaf. They use ASL, they're culturally deaf. Um, I am not. So I actually doubled my office politics issues when I came to CSD because now I needed to understand people who knew ASL and I needed to understand um, uh, people who spoke English, neither of which I could understand. <laughs> so, um, and communication is office politics. You know, that, that word uh, has negative connotation but it really is all about communication. Somewhere in your discussions, there is um, a lack of data. You know, the people that you're talking to don't understand some aspect of what you're trying to convey. I, 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 the last speaker talked about all the different things that she tried uh, and kind of ran down a list, you know, loops and ASO and, and captions and so on and so forth. And I, th I thought, you know, we should, that, that her experience should be bundled. That story needs to be communicated clearly to the, the powers to be in organizations. We talk about stories at CSD, we talk about the success stories and the trials and tribulations of folks like us and, uh, and what we go through and communicating those rich stories to people who are uh, otherwise clueless, I think is incumbent upon us to do that. It is incumbent upon the uh, individual who has um, the so-called disability to, to be very articulate about the options and the things that they, they, they want to accomplish and the frustrations, because that's when we start moving it from practical application of tools 
to personal frustration and politics. And those frustrations need to be communicated because part of being hard of hearing is the exhaustion, for example, that you get trying to, trying to understand you know, visual cues. It's the feeling of walking away from a meeting where you thought you got everything, but not being sure if you got everything. That's, that's, that's the politics of it. So what I do in that case is I read my part notes afterwards, and then I go back to the people, and I do uh, a paraphrasing exercise. And anyone I talk to to say, is this right? Is this right? Is this right? Do I have this correctly? Um, I train the uh, staff at CSD and other places on paraphrasing skills. You know, don't, don't just repeat the same word to me that I just missed. Paraphrase it differently using a different word. So these are really nuts and bolts communication things that we're calling politics, you know, but that it is incumbent upon us to educate the, um, the hearing people on, on these things. And when, when you do, I have found, when we do, they are open and there is insight and they, they do, I just didn't know. Only 5% of people in the workplace are jerks. Only 5%. <laughs> <laughs> so 95% so of the people want to help you. You know, they want to help you. And we give so much, we give so much to that 5%. You know, we spend so much time in the human resource world emphasizing those problem 5%. And that's not the population that you're interacting with. 95% of the people want to do the right thing. And we just need to educate them on how to do it. The, I just want to amplify that, you know, here, here for, for those statements, you know, the other way to look at it is, and, you know, so, so often it doesn't feel this way, but we're all on the same side. When an employer hires an individual, an employer is making a bet that that individual can not only do a job, but add real value to the organization. And they're investing a lot of time and money in that bet, and it's a positive bet on you as an employee. It makes sense for an employer, for a hiring manager, for a supervisor, and yes, for HR, to try to deliver positively on that investment. The employee, um, or the candidate, uh, and the employer want the same thing. So what feels like um, a gatekeeper exercise really is a collaboration and should be approached as an, a collaboration. And an employee you know, doesn't always know what the answer is, particularly if somebody's just acquiring a condition, if somebody's losing his or her hearing and isn't educated. How are they going to get educated? It is the responsibility of the individual and the responsibility of the employer to try to dialogue and problem solve openly. One thing that, that I've done innumerable times is matched up people who were acquiring or who newly acquired a condition with not, not just people in the organization, but people in my external network. Um, who have had that same set of challenges and are further along on the journey, not just for support, but to give ideas and information so that they can problem solve and we can all problem solve together. But starting out with that attitude that you and the employer and everybody on the team, the team needs you to succeed. The team is not successful, the group is not successful, unless every individual can be successful. And starting out with that mindset and emphasizing, this is what I need in order to do my best so we as a group can do our best is perhaps a really good way to think about it. Uh, I would add just real uh, quickly. Vettery, you had something to say. I'm, I'm sorry, thank you. Um, Almost 20 years ago, I was the tax accountant at my, at, at, at my location, and uh, I, I worked an audit for two years where I saved over $25 million that we had already received an invoice for from the state of Maryland. And, um, and my thanks was I, I was ranked in the third quartile and given a terrible performance review. And what I did was, and I'll say this to you, if you're right, I would document what you do, and I would hold their feet to the fire. If you're working for, as I was at that time, one of the 5% that Brian so eloquently put, um, hold their feet to the fire and make, 
human resources do their job. Um, there, you know, there's always two sides to every story, but uh, you know, I've been through that myself. I know our community uh, is subject to that at times. Um, make your case and, and, and back it up with facts. Um, to the previous, uh, late, uh, the, the woman who was asking about with all the challenges, wow. I would say, um, just like ASL signers, there are technical CART um, um, transcriptionists. So you, you might want to make that request. And, and I don't know that it would work with c running CART, but maybe a product like JAWS or some kind of a screen reading technology um, and a headset might help you um, digest what's coming over the CART and you're not missing it all. Just a thought, I don't know. Excellent question, thank you. Now we'll go to the other side of the room and I forgot which side of the room we were on. This side? <laughs> this side, okay, thank you. Kind of running out of time here and we've got a lot of questions so I, I hope we'll all keep our answers and questions brief. Um, I have two things, one I just wanted to announce that uh, in the last hour, the Supreme Court decided in favor of gay marriage five to four. And, and my second question is if you could give me some brief ideas about what an, a small employer can do if you're in a small nonprofit or something. Uh, particularly in terms of capturing a meeting or helping with a meeting that doesn't involve uh, the expense of CART and is there sources for how expensive these things are so you can bring them to someone and say uh, these are the different choices and what they might cost. Okay. Uh, uh, this is Barbara. I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I think we can let Bri Brian Patrick, did you have some thoughts on that or I can speak too. Um, first of all, I think the thing that has to happen is even small not-for-profits um, understand that having... Hello, I started answering. I'm so That's sorry. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a cup, I, I, I sympathize, and I, and I mentioned money before. Um, just in terms of, of meetings, I, I've been in, in a position where I've had to facilitate meetings and um, there are things that you can do that help that are not CART. Will they help enough? I don't know. It depends on your hearing loss. But things like make sure you have good sight line to the people in, in the meeting. You know, use a round table instead of a long rectangular table. Have, have meeting ground rules before you start out. One person talking at a time. I know many of you in a workplace are in meetings where people just can't help themselves, like I was doing, and you talk over people, right? <laughs> so having ground rules and, and enforcing those ground rules. And they benefit not only you, they benefit everyone. And that's one of the things I always try to reemphasize when I'm asking for accommodation, even if it's not, even if it's just behavior accommodation or behavior changes, they often benefit everyone. So things like you know, one person talking at a time. Someone mentioned earlier in the presentations, providing an agenda up front before the meeting. That helps people with hearing loss. That helps people with vision loss because then they can read it ahead of time and be um, not trying to figure it out at, on the moment, at the moment. So things like behaviors. Um, picking good meeting rooms. You know, this is a good room. It has carpet on the floors. It has acoustic tiles around the, the walls. Pick a better meeting room if you can. You know, things like that. So, you know, the things that are conducive to easier communication that are simply um, physical and behavioral things. So those don't necessarily cost you any money, but they might be enough to help you. Okay. I want to... I want to pile on to what Barbara had to say here, because I think one of the most important things you can do after you've done some of the things that she suggested is you can be sure to ask questions. And if you didn't get something, ask people to say it again in a different way, um, to rephrase that. And with a little practice, you can ask those questions for repetition in a way that allows you to not have to say 
you know, I didn't hear what you said. Or you can say, can you put that in a different word? Or can you explain that like you were trying to explain it to my grandmother? Or, you know, ask questions. I just want to I, I just want to add a couple more things because you talked you talked about the costs of CART and nonprofit organizations that don't have a lot of money for these things and there are I think there are you know some creative alternatives to that I mentioned uh, Skype in the in the hallways I actually use Skype including to talk to my own children uh, not using CART all the time but just using a, a CapTel phone because that's that's uh, legitimate you can use CapTel for remote communications. So, and that means even across the hallway, you can actually, as long as it's remote communications, you can use CapTel. CapTel is um, not nearly as accurate or as perfect as CART, but between having Skype and having CapTel, you, I have been able to pretty much figure out, you know, uh, what's going on in that, in that conversation. So I don't use CART 24 seven for every single conversation because from a <clears throat> practical standpoint, that's a hundred bucks an hour about CART. It's about a hundred dollars an hour. CapTel is FCC provided, it's, it's, it's free. Again, I'm not saying it's anything near the quality of CART uh, because it's not, but I have been able in my situation to use that as an accommodation to get the gist. The other answer to the question is about meeting management, having agendas, having a note taker uh, uh, at the meeting, uh, the person who's required to take the minutes. If they can't afford the CART, they can certainly afford you know, having minutes. A hybrid of CART is the meaning for meaning. Uh, I like meaning for meaning for um, um, meetings um, minutes because it's very well articulated. The gist of what is said is organized. It's a lot easier to read. And providing that t t uh, service is much cheaper, roughly half, maybe 60% of the cost of the cost of CART. We have time for one more question to share with the audience, I believe. So we'll go to this side. Yes, sir. Is it? Okay. Uh, I've been hard of hearing since grade school, and one of my frustrations, the frustrations I believe a lot of other people have shared, is the high cost of hearing aids. And my brother, in particular, long ago suggested that when I was looking for a job, that I ask about or even demand that my next employer cover the cost of hearing aids. So uh, my question to the panel is, you know, I guess legally, is that something we can ask? Can we ask about the benefits? If I accept this job, will HR, will the health care plan cover hearing aids? Or is that something I can try to negotiate if they offer me a job? Can I say, well, I'll accept the job on condition that health insurance cover the cost of a hearing aid every five years or something like that? So, um, uh, or is it that just something I just don't, I don't make enough money so that uh, hearing aids or a new hearing aid is a significant expense for me. Uh, so the, I, the yeah. short answer is yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> the, you can, under the ADA, you cannot request a personal device. You cannot demand your employer provide you with a hearing aid. That, that won't work but you can negotiate with them. You can ask them if hearing aids are part of the coverage of the insurance. You can work with them, and that's whether you have insurance now or you're, you're going to your next employer, you can ask about it. But you cannot demand it. It cannot be, you can demand it, but they're gonna say no, and they're entitled to say no. Yeah, we were part of a, um, a survey through the USBLN, and, and I think, um, the average age of our employees is approaching 50. You know, we employ a lot of baby boomers, and um, we cover, I think, everything but the batteries. Um, and it's just smart. It's, it's just a smart thing to do. Um, I, I agree. I, I, I've been told that you cannot request a personal device, and, but we had one gentleman request hearing aids. He said, but he would leave them at work and not take them home. <laughs> well, you know, which I was, you know, but your insurance covers it, but he didn't want to put in the claim for insurance. So um, I think you're going to find a lot of major employers do because it is. Um, no. No. 
Really? Yeah. I, I, the, I, I hate to disagree. I almost never disagree with you, Bob. But <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> as a major employer um, who does not, and wow. okay. I, you know, I'll freely admit that's a real problem, I want to turn to all of you and say, why the heck aren't we organizing companies to say, that's enough is enough. Right. We should all be including hearing aid coverage in our insurance plans. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, I mean, I would like nothing better. Bob and I are both very, very involved. Um, I, corporate advisory board and on the board of directors of, of the U.S. Business Leadership Network, one of the largest employer organizations. Part of the reason they did that survey is I asked they do that survey because uh -huh. I'm pissed off that we aren't <laughs> there yet. And I don't see why we aren't. Why? I mean, we just got marriage equality passed because people came together and said enough is enough. Why aren't we bringing employers together like mine? and taking a lead on this issue and getting coverage. It is damn expensive, and it really bugs me when I have an employee say, can we cover um, hearing aids? And we're not as progressive as you are, Bob. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. my pet And I was just given, I'm sorry. That's going to say, I my pet peeve is personal care assistance. So, but that's another story. I, I was just given, oh, I'm sorry, you finished? I can't hear well enough to let me stop. Is he finished? Okay, um, I was just given a note and a reminder that um, you can apply if you're a client of vocational rehab, you can apply and request hearing aids as part of either getting a job or even if you're on the job and are at risk of losing your job, you can become a client of VR and ask request for hearing aids as part of part of what the services they cover. Most states will do that, but it certainly depends on what how much, well funded they are, whether you'll get what you're looking for. Yes, uh, uh, communication services for the deaf just this year added hearing aids to uh, to their uh, uh, coverage. Now, just just this year, I would think. I'm going to guess that at least 50% of the people in that office have hearing aids, uh, but they, they, they weren't covered under the insurance. I absolutely agree with Lori's comment. Sometimes you just need to embarrass these people into it. And, and that's basically when I we sat down and looked at our, our covers, my God, we are, this is what we do. We, we, we have to lead by at least doing this. And, the, and that is what, you know, put that decision over. It's the insurance companies that are largely making these decisions. That's what you need to understand. The employer didn't start there. The employer buys the package of benefits. The insurance companies do not put hearing aids in that package because they are one and done expensive. And the employer goes for that because they think so few people will actually benefit in terms of the population. That's, that's the, the business issue that we're, um, that we're up against. Wow. But they just need to do it because it is so baseline. And one of the biggest issues is that people who need hearing aids don't use hearing aids because they may not even realize they need them or they don't know the benefits of them because it's not so standard. It's not an option that's just standardized, and I think we just need to get there. A lot of, a lot of people don't realize that insurance companies base, in many cases, their coverages on what Medicaid, Medicare offers. When Medicare was authorized in 1965, it was statutorily prohibited that Medicare provide coverage for eyeglasses, dentures, and hearing aids. So I'm really proud to say that Lisa Hamlin and the rest of the team at HLAA is very actively working on Capitol Hill to try to introduce legislation that will one day get hearing aids included under Medicare and also to um, provide tax credits for people to help defray some of the cost of purchasing hearing aids. We're not here yet, but that's just one of the things that HLAA is involved in. All right, we are about five minutes from the witching hour of 12 noon. I'm sorry that we didn't have time to get to all of your questions today, but please tweet your question to hash sign HLAA2015, email your question to me, Valerie, at ACS Captions, and we will bring these questions forward to the panelists, and um, we'll get those answers out to you. 
I want to thank all of you for taking three hours out of your time at this convention to spend it with us. I would like to thank all of our panelists who took time out from their busy work schedules to be here with us. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much.